to the Christmas and you can just open them and take the chocolate out of the box. So we've designed a website which was quite similar to this idea. So each furni furniture you could just um, take from the website and rotate it and just see it. And so the choco is from chocolate and four is for furniture. Uh, furniture. So, and the project was abandoned very quickly, <laughs> but the name was like stayed in my head for a, uh, quite a long time. We were also, um, yeah, maybe I can show it. We were also creating this notextures.com website. And I was always confusing the names. I was always calling this website Choco4. So that's why I thought, oh, yeah, let's just keep using this name for the Blender site. And about this website, it's actually not working, to be honest. Um, this is the website where we wanted to sell some of the textures we were creating as a team. But right now, all of the textures you see here, or maybe most of them, I would say, are shared through the Chocofour store, which is under cho store chocofour.com. Here in the free sections, you have, um, sorry, in the shaders, all the different categories. Let's check concrete, for example. So all of all of those shaders are available for free. You can download them after logging in to Chocofour account. And all of the textures, sorry, I just clicked something. All of the textures are shared under the CC0 license. So you can base, it's like, I would say they are open source textures. So so you can you can just buy, like download all of them, all of the stuff you, you find here and use them in your projects, use them in your scenes, use them, I don't know, you can even sell the textures themselves if you want to. If you, yeah, if you want to. <laughs> um, and yeah, so if since we are speaking about it, this is the bricks uh, section, which which was added a few weeks, a few f yeah, this previous month. So all the textures are also created with the new micro displacement feature in mind. And sa same thing, you can just download them for free and use them with CC0 license. So they are open source basically can use them in your projects. Some of the textures, I don't think the bricks, but uh, most of the textures are also available through Blender Cloud. So if you're, you have a, an account there, you can also use them this way. So um, yeah, I think that's quite a long explanation for the name. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, if someone else would ask, like to ask anything. Do you develop furniture? Do you create furniture? That was the idea a few years ago, but in the end, uh, we've ended up doing a 3D furniture. But also not our designs, some of the designs that are uh, wide of available on the market. So we are doing 3D representation. We don't stick to a certain brand, like we only do three companies who we, which we like. We just pick uh, different furnishings we find interesting because me and my friends I work with, we most of us have the architectural education, so we are also kind of in this um, industry for a longer time than I'm just using Blender. And this all mixes <laughs> all together. Personally, what is the most difficult thing uh, to you when you are trying to model furniture? What is the advantage of that? The worst thing is finding references, uh, complete references. For example, sorry for this product placement all the time, but it's, uh, I mean, these are the examples I can talk about experiencing everything myself. So for example, creating those windows, uh, windows and doors models was real pain because finding a correct 
references. I know there are many uh, manufacturers on the market who provide the technical drawings and stuff, but finding a complete reference, because I'm also not modeling all the stuff myself, I would say 90% of, of the models aren't modeled by me right now, but to create a, for example, when I send, when I need a model like this, I send a briefing to the people I work with, mostly online, and I need to describe this model, right? So I need to find the correct references. I need to make a descriptions. For example, don't model all the stuff inside the window because we won't see it and it will increase the poly count to one billion. So we don't need it. But when you try to combine all those little elements all together and create a nice briefing and in the end receive a model like this, it's, I would say it's 50% of my work. So. In terms of modeling, this is the biggest issue, I would say. Finding a references, finding correct materials, combining them all together, making a nice brief. But speaking of myself, if I would have to answer the question, what's the biggest problem from with model? Like, that was the question for me when I model furniture. Um, I would personally say furniture aren't this hard to model. Um, perhaps, or maybe the other category. I would say the sofas could be the most difficult because of the details you have to add. And so all those wrinkles you see, you could try using bump mapping and right now we could try using the displacement uh, modifiers and, and shader features, but I think it's quite hard to do it using the the textures, so you always, I mean always, we always m just model it. And the hardest thing is finding a proper balance between adding enough detail, not having the meshes too heavy, and finding the proper quality. So, so finding this balance, because for example, if you create a model like this, and someone wants to use it in a super close-up picture, then you have this issue, yeah, not everything might look super nice, but when you add too many details and then you use those models only on the f like second plan or third plan on the picture, it's way too heavy. So finding a proper balance is also an issue. And the modeling of those kind of wrinkles isn't this hard in my opinion. When you go to the website and to the quick tips category, there's a wrinkle modeling tutorial explain on this kind of a model, which you can also download for free. Yeah, and using those slideshows, everything is quite clear, I would say, thanks to the knife tool right now, which, which is working really, really nice right now, in my opinion. Um, yeah, we have two more minutes, and I really hope this mic's gonna work. Uh, related to that, uh, so uh, never uh, did you ever f use or uh, felt the need to use? Baking an uh, an eye poly and a lower poly, even if it's not for real time, or uh, or never. How how, uh, how often, if ever, did you bake down the details like these creases or other details to? Yeah. So if I understood correctly, your question is. Uh, did I ever or how often do we create a high poly models, sculpt them for example, and then downgrade to lower poly? Uh, never. <laughs> never. We, uh, the, yeah, the thing is we only have one hour, so if I would like to explain all the modeling processes we use and the shading, I think even three hours wouldn't be enough, but our base approach to modeling is having the models uh, subdivision ready, I would say. So for every model, when you apply subdiv subdivision surface modifier, it gives you this little bit, a, a bit more dense mesh. 
So all the details that might be not visible uh, at first, when you add the subdivide surface modifier, they kind of kind of pop out. And with this one modifier, you can have this basic control over the mesh density. So for example, if I have a nicely detailed model, and I, but I just keep it in the background, I can disable the modifier and all the details are gone, but the, the shape is more or less the same. Um, and we just do it by, let's call it poly modeling. So we just do it by hand, I would say, with a, a traditional modeling techniques, no sculpting involved. For some of the models, we, I must, I must admit, we use Marvelous Designer. So it's a software which is made like exclusively for modeling um, fabrics and, and this kind of stuff. But I would say we, we, ne we don't do furnishings with, with this. Maybe, maybe the beds, I think, on the website were made. Uh, uh, yeah, I think the beds were made using Marvelous Designer. And it's also not because Blender can't do it, I would just say there are some tools more efficient at work at certain areas that Blender. And if, if, you, if you want to, you can even hand paint textures all, all in Blender, but why, why would you do it if you can use 2D applications, right? You can do it, of course. Um, yeah, okay. Be <laughs> um, can you give me one minute? Maybe I will just ask if the mic will be working or, or not. Is it working as a microphone? Um, are, are you using this one? No, I want to use this okay. one. Do they both work? Uh, I'll put a new battery in this one. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we can start. H hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. And I really hope you're going to enjoy uh, my one hour workshop. I would like to talk a lot, but I also think it would be very nice if we could have, uh, l let's call it a conversation. So you ask questions, I answer them because I, I get quite a lot of questions online about various things, not only Blender related, but um, Blender and let's call it business related questions about freelancing and stuff. So I'm open to all of them if you have any. So I would like to start my, and I hope it's not, I hope you won't be mad at me if I use just the Chrome for presenting some of the stuff because it's just way faster and crash proof. So I would like to start with a small animation I created last year. And let's hope it works. I created this animation a year ago was I really wanted to show some people what's actually possible in a free 3D software using completely free 
freely available models today. Because in my opinion, I, I work in a prof professional industry, I can say, uh, really a lot of people isn't aware of what's actually possible in Blender today because they, are, they, they, they touched Blender five or six years ago while it was still in 2.4 whatever phase. And yeah, that's the only thing they know about Blender up until today. So I've created this animation to show, show it to my colleagues, show it to some other people from the industry that you can actually do it spending zero zero money on software, zero money on assets. And why I found this important is because I was using, like, first of all, the Blender is an amazing tool, which I had this conversation during this conference, um, which I would also use if it was paid. Because very often people say, oh yeah, it's a nice free tool, right? But I would really pay for Blender nowadays if it was commercial, commercial software, right? I'm not using it because it's free, I'm using it because it's really the best tool for the things I create commercially for many years right now. And this is the, the standpoint of my presentation because I think in a difference to many people, I started using Blender not as a hobbyist, not as a something of interest. I was just studying architecture and I needed a tool to visualize my projects. And I don't know how the architectural market work, looks in other countries, but in Poland, I found it way more profitable to do visualizations and CG graphics later on instead of architecture. And, but I still find the studies very interesting and it's, that's very well funny and interesting that many people with architect, architectural background, they, they later migrate to CG industry, to VFX industry, to other um, automotive industries and so on. So, on my website, I'm also sharing, sorry, sorry for this pl product placement. I, it's really not my intention to do it, but I just have all those slides embedded to the website, so I really hope you, you forgive me that. Um, so, on this slideshows, I just wanted to quickly show the, the stuff I, I create in Blender and the most fascinating thing for me is the cycles features, which were already there in 2011. <laughs> um, we, all, we often think like, yeah, until we got the micro displacement and volumetrics and subdivision surface scattering, it wasn't a professional tool, right? But I think that's, that's a, well, that's an, not a correct thinking. It really depends of what you can do with the tool and not what the tool actually necessarily has from the very beginning. So maybe I will show a few more works. And, oh yeah, of course. I, I will just repeat it maybe. It really depends. Uh, so I will repeat the questions. If I look for references when I'm creating my work, right? That's the question. Um, for example, the pictures you see here, those two, they are crossed, so I hope you, you can imagine the look more or less. <clears throat> These are commercially based projects. So very often I receive some references from the clients and they say, yeah, I want to have an interior in this style or in this style. So. I just kind of try adapting to this approach. They, they are kind of forcing on me. But very often, um, I, I of course create my own kind of interiors, if I can just show one. Um, there is a one scene on my store which I basically created myself. And I wasn't even having any references for this one and I'm really uh, honest on that. And I don't know, I think some of the some of the thoughts, some of the inspirations you may have on the projects just come from from the general knowledge you may have in this certain area. So for example, if you just watch the architectural pictures for five years, for ten years, you just kind of get saturated with, with it. And sometimes it just comes by itself, I would say. 
Um, but I personally, like, you can see this picture, this furnishing, this, let's say, style is um, quite, I would say, distinct. So you can say this is definitely not a Scandinavian or a rustic interior, right? And this is more or less the style I personally like. This is the interior, the imagery, the, the architectural style I just like. And yeah, maybe this is, I just remember those kinds of references and pictures I, I, I like, which are appealing to me and I just re later recreate them. I think this is the answer. But very often the references uh, just come from the clients. Sometimes some clients just say, yeah, do it, make it nice. So I just, I just do it the way I find nice, and it, to be honest, it usually gets there. I would say eight out of ten times. Um, yeah. So I will just very quickly say why did I even started this this website and and the store. The b main reason was since I have this commercial approach to Blender, I really was lacking the assets av available for it. So, and I of course know you can always uh, buy or download models made for other software, but you always have to convert them and always have to go through this troublesome process, which gets really troublesome when you have projects, you really want to make job quick and you really know because of this conversion thing, you, you have to spend 30 hours on a thing that could be done in 12 hours. So you either have to charge more or you're just you know charging less, but you have to work more. And that, that kind of sucks, I would say. So that's why I gradually started creating this database, mostly just for testing, to be honest. As I, as I explained the, the, the websites, the, the names, like backstory, uh, before we started, so we, we were thinking with a few friends of doing a website where we would just share our own um, design ideas, and we came up with this website idea of those little ad advanced calendar thing, where you have those little windows uh, in December, I don't know if it's uh, in your country, and you just open those little chocolate windows and you eat them, of course. So we had this choco, chocolate for furnishing idea so we could just play with this little furnishings, but it didn't work out. <laughs> but the name stayed because it was very catchy, I would, I would say. So yeah, uh, the main reason of creating the website was the, simply the lack of professionally made assets. And I have, uh, I've been working at Evermotion company, perhaps some of you know it, it's a big, developer of 3D assets for 3ds Max. Hi guys, if you're watching. Uh, <laughs> maybe. And yeah, so I, I would say I had a quite solid background as well in that field, and I just started doing it. And it, I'm doing it up until today, up until now, and I would like to now uh, smoothly switch to the making process of those little pictures you see here. So these are, I, I call them a pack shot renderings. These are the renderings you can very often see in uh, furniture catalogs or even in, the, in your local shopping mall sometimes when they advertise the food and stuff. So it's usually a product shoot on the white background so it easily blends with the layout of the newspaper or a website or a catalog. And yeah, I really hope you, uh, in my opinion, there is no rocket science behind it, but uh, there are some things I would really like to talk about quickly and yeah, and just show you the entire process. So I'll, I'll be taking the unfinished model, placing it in the scene, creating it from the scratch and just hopefully having a final render by the end of the presentation. Let me just see if I didn't miss anything. Yeah, and if during this process I skip something because, you know, when you work, sometimes you just do things, you don't find them hard for others. So if I just skip something, just wave your hand and we can, I, I hopefully will be able to explain it. So yeah, uh, by the way, you can see my Blender layout is a bit different to the default one, so I have a, a 
the main 3D screen here, uh, additional screen here just to help me out with camera navigation, uh, 2D layout here, and node editor in here, and just some buttons and basic stuff here. So yeah, let's, let's get started. If you have any questions, just, just ask them maybe before we go. Okay, so I guess we are good. Um, yeah, maybe before we go, I will just show you quickly. Um, because obviously when I'm creating those huge amounts of renderings, I'm not creating the studio from the scratch. So, oh yeah, and by the way, uh, this whole presentation, I would say in a nutshell, is available to download from, from the website. It's not everything I'm saying, of course, but I would say the most uh, important steps you would have to take to create those kind of renderings, some things you have to pay attention to, and yeah. So if you, if you just go to chocofruit.com, there's a my account thing, which a lot of people complain about because it sometimes doesn't work, and I, I get it, it's all very rough, roughly made, but I'm not an IT guy, unfortunately. Yeah, so when you log in, there's a whole list of free, free available stuff, and there's a Blender conference folder where you can download the PDF. Yeah, so repeating your question, uh, the models look nice <laughs> and they seem uh, expensive to produce and if there are enough sales or I is the business even profitable, <laughs> right? Is this whole idea even making sense? I would say it didn't for, it didn't until I started committing myself to it. So for, uh, well, say for two and a half years, I was just doing it as a side job more or less. So I had some assets. I had to create myself. I was just putting them online, as many people do. But it was a side job, I would say. But last year, uh, for so several reasons, I decided to spend a little bit more time on the website and everything. And this year, I really decided to commit. And I would say it, it makes sense, at least. So yeah, if, if that explains the question. Yeah, so be, let me just see, OK. It's, so before we move, I will maybe just show you the, the basic studio I use. Uh, it's really nothing, in my opinion, fancy. Yeah, that's it. A, a little bit different layout, but you hopefully get the idea. So there is an additional navigation window I have here. There's a main window where I place the models and do the composition, and there is just the color um, shader adjustment window. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> because I, I don't know how to do it right now. I'm just too focused. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I really hope it's visible on the stream, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, so anyway, let's just start. I, I, I usually just start with a simple, very simple plane, and that's it. Um, but that's definitely not all. If I would have to recreate the studio I just showed you, I would start with a plane like this and add uh, shader library I've created, which is also available online. I won't be focusing on that uh, on that right now. So it's a choco for node groups. I just put it somewhere under the big plane, which is the center of the scene. And yeah, this allows me to. This gives me a quick access to all the shader groups I use. And thanks, Bartek, for a very nice introduction to the what's behind all of this to the whole science behind it uh, because I, would, I wouldn't be able to do it. But yeah, I've created a, f for example, as Bartik was showing you, you can build your shaders using the certain attributes like reflectivity, uh, color, diffuse, transparency, whatsoever. And you just 
I, I, in my opinion, this is the best feature of Cycles because it really show it, it's really very similar to the traditional create creating process when you're drawing, for example. When you draw, you focus on the shape at first, then you focus on the color, and then you, when you see the reflections, you just add them. And this is very similar to how Cycles works. So I just create the basic color, and I add just the uh, just the diffuse node, right? Later, when I see, okay, there are some reflections visible, then I create the glossy node, then I start combining them and making the picture, um, you know, realistic or w whichever effect I want to achieve. So yeah, but getting back to the studio, I, I start with those two very basic planes. And then, of course, I just add the camera. Um, no, and this is the first mistake I made, actually. I just, I always try keeping the camera to those uh, global axes, so it's always rotated, especially in the X or Y axis, so it always keeps the 90% degree, and I will explain that in a second. Uh, I very quickly changed the render resolution to, let's say, 1200, so I have the square uh, layout. And you can, of course, use the other resolutions, but this is what I start with. And yeah, just, just very roughly drop the camera somewhere. So I have the basic view of the scene, and then I import the model. And we will be using a model which is not available online yet, so I really ensure you this is the, it's happening live. So, yeah, the first thing I, I think is really important to mention at this stage is the object scale you have in your scenes. And very often, I, I, I kind of understand it, it's very often easy to forget about it when you're working, when you're in a rush, so you just start adding the objects, sticking them together, and in the end you have the, everything is made in kilometers, for example. It might not be an issue, and it probably usually isn't, but let me just show you the very basic example. For example, you create a plane. For some reason, you just scale it up, and then you add solidify modifier. So you add some values to it. Or maybe that's not the way, yeah. And somewhere during the process, you apply the scale, the actual scale to the model. And then all of a sudden, all the settings you might have done here, let's say also with the displacement modifier, everything's gone and you don't know what happened. And the reason for that is because we, we, we just very often omit the, the importance of using correct uh, scale and, and units in the scenes. So what I, to me, it's a, also a very practical thing to do because I really want the models to work as fast as possible when I really need them. So for example, when I import a chair to the scene, I don't really want to have this huge blob appearing out of nowhere. So I really would, would expect it to behave like a, a real chair. Um, so the, yeah, the, the main reason, <laughs> the, the basic thing you can do is just using the units in your scenes, which are found under the scene settings. And I'm just using the traditional metric scale. And this chair actually looks pretty, pretty well made. So I would say the, this element is usually somewhere around 40 centimeters. I also don't do it like super precise because very often even if the objects are in a correct scale, you have to you know, scale them up and down slightly so they maybe look better or worse. But um, it's, I, th I think you know what I'm talking about. It's just good to keep the things uh, in a correct scales. So after scaling up or down the model, I just apply the scale, sorry. So I use Control A shortcut. There we have this apply and all of different different options here. So it's a 
I always choose ro rotation and scale and what it does. What it does, it, it makes all those modifiers predictable, all the par particle systems and simulations predictable. And for example, when we rotate the object, just, just to give you the very clear example of how it works, when we change to the normal orientation, then I have all my navigation axis following the rotation of the object. But let's say when I apply the rotation, then it zeroes all the coordinates, which were all the transformation which was applied to the object. So right now, Blender reads this object like, yeah, this is the zero rotation, zero scale, zero everything. I know it sounds uh, unnecessary maybe, but it's quite important, I would say. Yeah, so let's just get back to the chair. We start with a very simple camera. And, and I will make this wrong at first. So later on we can compare the correct camera work, I would say, with the incorrect one. So very often, and this comes quite naturally, when we would take a picture of something, we would just stand up, point the camera like this, and just shoot the picture. And this is what most of people do in Blender as well. So yeah, I'm just pointing to my picture. If someone read a bit about composition, he knows, yeah, you could use this uh, rule of thirds. So let's, let's use this. Here in Blender, we have those composition settings or guides. And yeah, let's just maybe even do it like this. I could say it's done, right? Yeah, so let's just keep it because very often you see those kind of pictures, right? So I want to have my object in the center. I want to have it fully shown. Voila. But I think there is really much more attention has to be put to the camera work, when, especially when doing pack shot uh, renders. So I will just duplicate this camera clear the rotation and start once again. So first thing I would say it's really essential to doing a nice uh, pack shot renderings is using the way higher focal length value. I would say 50 is like the, the minimum you should use. And um, what I personally use very often is at least 80. So this might require you to move the camera way off the, the screen. And the reason for using the higher lens values is that it, it, it just uh, negates all the perspective this distortion you, could, you normally have with a wider lens, with yeah, wider lenses. So for example, if I move the camera uh, close to the object here, I still have it in the in the full view, but you see in those vertical lines this this whole model gets kind of you know distorted and that's that's really not good when you want to show your product to the or when the customer wants to show the product to someone because he wants to show the product as it's actually viewed in real life and those kind of lenses don't help us with 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 this process so First thing I would say is using way uh, higher focal length value. The second thing I would really recommend doing is instead of rotating the camera uh, in X axis, I would recommend using the shift uh, lens shift values. So what it basically does, it, it the best way to explain it I would say is when I move camera off of the screen, you, you still can see the chair, right? And it, for example, I, I move the camera like this, and I really like the way the chair looks here in this in this actual view, right? But but my my camera is rendering this blank space. So how can I make this actual chair appearing here in the middle of my camera? And that's why we use those. For that, we can use those lens values. So for example, I move. Come on. <laughs> I never update. 
No. Because it's so unpredictable. You update it the day before the conference, and then you open your laptop and... Yeah, so first thing I would say are using the lens shift values, not necessarily for uh, the X axis, but definitely for Y axis, because again, when we rotate the camera, <coughs> when we rotate the camera, it also distorts the, the way the model is presented. Sometimes you can use a little bit of rotation in the x-axis, but I would really, like, wouldn't go too, too far with it. So doing something like this, and let's say I want to show more of the seed, I would definitely decrease the value and just move camera upwards. So now it shows, I can even extend, like, overshow this effect to you. So yeah, in this, in this particular case, I will just use, oops, those values. Zoom the camera a little bit closer, and I would say in terms of camera, camera settings, that's it for this particular scene. Um, what's also quite, quite important, at least, uh, is the way you, you, you show the model. So you could, you could think like this kind of presentation is right, but I, from my experience, why, why not show this nice leg element what, which is behind those elements? Why, why would I cover an interesting parts of the model with the other parts of the model? And with the, this very simple trick, I can, <laughs> trick, right? <laughs> um, I can just show more of the model I'm presenting, you know? So it's really, and it happens very often when people just present their stuff and they just don't emphasize all the amazing things that are happening to their uh, to the thing they 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 spend so much time modeling and they just don't emphasize it. And it's not about em emphasizing it in here. It's just about sh you know showing all I can about the model. So for example, it would be nice to show those parts a little bit more, but maybe the seat should be a bit more visible. It and yeah, and here you just. On this stage, you just play, and, and I don't know if, if there are any advices I could give. You just have to do it till it's good, I would say. Remembering those very basic principles, so not covering the back elements with the front elements and keeping the camera settings so, they don't, so the perspective is not distorting the model. And yeah, and the rule of thirds also helps you in that, I would say, because it helps you keeping the, the correct composition of the, the entire picture. So yeah, I, I've spent quite a lot of time talking about camera, but I think it's really important because now when you compare, oh. when we compare this camera work to this camera, I think the difference is, it's quite obvious, right? I think this picture just looks more pleasant in my opinion. It's a little bit more technical, but it's also showing the model in its fullness. So when I come back to the perspective view, when I see the chair, when I can rotate it, I more or less get the idea of the shape. But when I have just one picture, I really need to show the most of the shape I'm actually able to view in 3D. So I hope it's, I hope you follow. Um, yeah, there is also one bug I've noticed in the model before I brought it here. As you can see, there is small offset in the geometry, so I have to fix it uh, quickly. Before we move to the shading. Or maybe before we move to the shading, I will talk a little bit more about the, the scene illumination itself. So when we just press Shift Z button right now, we have this very basic illumination. And to be honest, I very often, I've very often seen uh, renders in professional catalogs which have more or less the quality you're seeing right now, which is quite striking because in Blender, how much time did we spend right now on this 
five minutes maybe of the actual work without explanations and and my talking. So I guess that's a <laughs> something you should really remember because those kind of pictures, you can make actual commercial projects creating this kind of stuff and it really takes not this much time to do it in Blender, I would say it just takes a few minutes. So the basic illumination of the scene I'm using is just a white um, background without anything added. I also, um, just to make sure if, if we have no difference between, yeah. So in order to negate this color difference here, I just create the very, very basic shader for the ground plane, which is also fully white, which is I know it's not physically correct, as many people say, but in this environment, which is artificial anyway, we can, we can use it this way. So before I move to shading, I, the problem with uh, having a nice reflections is in this kind of scene is the, the white nature of the entire environment. So I, I have to cheat a little bit. And I'm tweaking my, my environment light settings a little bit. And I will very quickly show you what I want to achieve. Mm. I will add an environment texture. Oh. Oh, sorry, I just edited the material. So in my production pipeline, let's say, I'm using a real, real life studio HDR map. So this map was, uh, this HDR map was shot in the actual photo studio with the real equipment uh, established around the, the object. And very often I, I'm, when I do some preview renders for myself, I, I just use this kind of a setup. So I have those nice shadows cast by the real life equipment. Yeah, and that's it. But in the production environment, I need to keep this white background thing so I can't just later Photoshop all the details from the picture, all the shadows so it's white and bright. And to do it, I'm using this very little hack which is also explained on my website, and I, if some of you saw it already, I just ap apologize, but. So I basically mix two background nodes, and one of them will have this texture attached to it. The thing I would like to achieve is having this nice environment visible in the reflections only. So to show it a little bit more, in a, in a bit more obvious way, I will create a Suzanne. Um, add a very basic glossy shader. So, when I get back to my HDR, I always, this name is so hard. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. So you ha now you see those nice reflections appearing on the surface and in order to keep both the white background and the reflections, I'm using this little hack where I have two background nodes. One of them has the texture applied and I'm just adding the um, light path node which might be quite confusing, but the way I understand it is here we mix two things, just make this one or this one, I always have problem uh, finding which one of them works. Just make one of those visible to the, reflect to the reflections only. So we use the glossy input here. Yeah, it's, it's not working, but when I switch those two pins, 
then voila, we have this nice cheat, but that's the only way to have a nice reflections in this kind of wide environment. So this is something I use daily. And in order to rotate this texture so we can point the reflections light, uh, reflection lights a little bit more, I'm just adding the very basic setup here. So it's texture coordinate node uh, and vector mapping. So then, using this value here, we can rotate the, the sphere around the model. Say we set 90 degrees. Just really need to keep, keep my timing. So let's get back to our chair. And now, even though it's not visible, I'm pretty sure when I start adding or adjusting my shaders, the reflection is gonna work nice on, on here. And yeah, let's let's move to the materials. So I, as I showed you on, on the very beginning, um, I've added this plane here. So I have all of my nodes set up, ready to go. So the whole process is way faster than creating the nodes by myself every single time I, I import a new model. But let's do it very quickly right now. So for making this wooden material, I will I, I personally always start with creating this very basic shader, which is diffuse mixed with glossy, the way uh, Bartek showed you already, mixing them together and plugging, yes. And I, here I have to pause for a second <laughs> because uh, this is a very, like to me, it's a very common bug. I don't, it's a feature. Not a bug. Um, I, I guess there is a science behind it, um, but I want to show you one thing. Uh, s s physically speaking, there, is, there isn't something like I'm creating right now. So a surface which, is, which doesn't have any thickness, but it exists, right? Something ha everything around us ha has to have any thickness, uh, some thickness, at least one atom of thickness or whatever. But in 3D world, uh, we we can we kind of um, cannot <laughs> we don't have to do it as as in a real world. So, for example, when we have model like that, and when you have the double-sided feature disabled, you can see. Blender needs to know, uh, if I have an object like this, what's the front and what's the back of the object? So in the viewport, it's, it's very easily visualized by having those back kind of faces darkened and the front faces brightened, right? It all, all makes sense, all works good, until, until we, we start adding a Fresnel here. So let's say we want to mix this color diffuse uh, attribute of the material with the reflectivity. We add the, let's say, uh, yeah, for now. And it seems to be working fine when we view the model from the let's call it positive normal side, but when we move back, then, then we see some strange things happening here. It all disappears when we use the uh, solidify modifier. So we have all faces kind of po pointing outwards. They are, they are all positive, so to speak. They, they have no negative values, but as, as soon as we remove it, then we have all those strange things happening. And you might be thinking, yeah, so let's just use solidify modifiers and that's it. But when you have tree models, for example, which have lots of leaves, and usually you create leaves just by using a simple plane because there are, yeah, it's the best way to do it, the fastest way to do it, um, then you might have this problem with this incorrect reflections on your leaves. And what I found out basically by mistake one day is when you use the layer weight node, it has those two features, uh, two, two outputs for null and facing. So when you use the facing node here, it always works, no matter if you're pointing on the 
negative normal uh, normals of the geometry or on the positive normals. So that's yeah, one thing I really wanted to mention because it's a uh, uh, for some reason, a uh, lot, lot of people doesn't know about it. So that's why in my shader I'm using the facing node. And if you if you pay attention to the Bartek's presentation, he showed those very nice uh, curve graphs. So what I'm doing here is kind of a No, I, I, uh, I just deleted the plane, but it doesn't work. Uh, yeah, the question was if I use the Fresnel output in this node, uh, doesn't it work like the facing? So is the bug produ produced with this uh, output as well? And it is. I know there is a science behind it because it's a negative value and, and so on. If, uh, yeah, there is a question. Yeah, so this is what I actually understood. So that's why I said there is a science behind it. So we, when we have the negative values of the, when we have the negative normals, everything works as it should. It just needs a, a different shader. So I, I know, uh, yeah, I'm calling it a bug. I know it's not a bug, it's a feature, literally. Uh, just to make it more easier in a production environment, I'm just using the facing output here, which is not, physically correct, but when you apply this curve here, and to explain what this curve actually does, I, I've, um, I very quickly will link to my website. So the Fresnel thing, as it was explained, simulates this effect you can see here. So on the edges of the geometry, you have these little reflections when you and I have the node setups here. So when the curve is very flat in this area, it makes the middle of the object uh, basically a color, right? When the curve gets a little bit up and upper, we get way more reflections here. And what's very important in my opinion is having this little uh, offset in here, so the curve never touches the zero point because there, there isn't such a situation when working dead on the object, there is no reflection. And this is, this is what happens when we just <coughs> connect the facing node like this. This is exactly what happens when we have this a 90 degree view on the geometry, there is absolutely no reflection, which is not correct. So what I, what I very quickly want to show you is no, I just create this kind of a flat curve with a few few points. So it more or less simulates the reflections. I know it's away from physical correctness, but but it looks nice. Uh, and it works throughout the projects, and that's the most important thing, I would say. Uh, what I'm just trying to do here is clamping the some of the light sources. And to do it very, very quickly, because we just have 10 more minutes, I will add, I'm using the, in my, in my pipeline, in my projects, I'm using the very basic uh, diffuse textures. I'm not using procedural textures, and it's not because I don't like them, because they're very awesome. Uh, the problem is the people who, who buy my models are not only Blender users, and if I would like to, to share my models with, uh, within the other applications, then I have the problem of, of Blender textures, which are not transferable to uh, outside the Blender, right? Uh, so that's why I decided, yeah, let's just keep the things quite primitive, I would say, but at least working. So something I would say about the OBJ format, that, which I'm also supporting, 
because we have many different file formats, but OBJ always works somehow. And same here. Um, I'm also very often adding this hue saturation and value node here just to quickly col color correct the texture. Instead of jumping uh, to 2D applications, I just do it, mostly do it in Blender. So I add a little tint to it. Sometimes, well, usually I'm just decreasing the saturation a little bit so it's more natural. And I could also apply the same thing on the threads here. But um, the thread material is way, re way less reflective than this polished wood material, so I would just probably, well, in the final product, I wasn't, wouldn't just use the diffuse uh, material with, with texture uh, on it. But this presentation is really uh, ending soon. So I want to make at least this this one picture. Yeah, this could definitely use more reflections, uh, some reflections, I would say. So to find a quick solution right now, I will probably use one of my group nodes, which is I usually use glossy shader node. Just quickly plug in the texture and let's say Just do 0 0.5 reflection glossiness. These values are working a bit different to the normal glossy shader values. Mm. I'm not happy with it, to be honest, but maybe if I change the color a little bit. I can also use my one of my group nodes here, uh, which is called Color Correct. This is quite a big group, but what it what it basically includes, I just jump in. It looks quite complex, but it really isn't. Um, it just separates RGBA channels into I don't even I don't even remember what to be honest. Uh, but anyway, you can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is a one thing I, I would have to mention here, but we really don't have time because what each texture has three color channels, right, uh, <laughs> red, blue, and green, and each one of the f those colors can be also used, just the color channels can be used as an input for, let's say, glossiness or bump, because usually those textures which we use for bump mapping are white and gray, uh, wh black and white, <laughs> and yeah. So why won't why why should we create another map just to simulate this one? In fact, we could just use one of the channels, which is already available in the colored diffuse texture. So that's why I've created this uh, color correct node, and it uses some of the color channels. You can um, you can switch between those channels. Somewhere, bump look, yeah, with this look setting. So minus is red, zero is green, and one is blue. And the mixing between them doesn't work that well, but at least I can switch the channels here. But yeah, getting back on track, I would say we just change the hue of this thread material. Yeah, and it it's more or less there. So I will just launch a very quick rendering and hopefully manage to do some color correction. Yeah, it looks okay. So yeah, while we are rendering, oh yeah, maybe I should have checked the samples, right? Uh, let's say we can stick to it. Um, yeah, so we have five more minutes. I would really like to do a quick uh, color correction on that, but if you have any questions right now while it's rendering, I'm very uh, open to answer. Yes, because, yeah, thank you. The question was if I use the separate color channels for impacting the particular 
effects like glossiness, bump, or reflections. Yeah. Um, the thing is, it's uh, uh, when you when you have the surfaces like this table, right? The reflection isn't uniform, so it has its bumps and highlights and darker uh, darker areas. So you can use a texture to simulate this effect. And instead of creating a separate map, which is usually uh, black and white in different values, you can use one of the color channels of the diffuse texture. So I, I will very quickly jump to Photoshop and sorry for not using GIMP, but <laughs> I started with GIMP. So when we go to the channels, this is more or less how, a, let's say, a bump mapping looks. Like, bump mapping texture looks like. So why create a separate map and load it to Blender and increase the memory use when we can just use RGB and just point to a certain channel and yeah. So w what you can see here is this glossy look. So this is channel RGB more or less. And for example, here I have the glossiness level, and I can, uh, s same with the reflection strength, I can plug those inputs here to my, to my shader. It's all explained on the website, to be honest. No, it's not, it, from the back end, it works correctly, but it's not physically accurate uh, in, in like scientific sense. It makes a visually correct results, I would say, but it's not mathematically correct whatsoever. So having this, <laughs> I forget adding a spot lamps to the, to the picture, but yeah, let's, let's, let's just continue. Um, yeah, the, this, this rendering looks good, I would say. That's why I've saved it. But to make it even better, I would just add two spot lamps. And the qu there might be a question why I'm using spot lamps. Well, because they, they, they create much better shadows, in my opinion. Uh, they can be adjusted, so I can, I have a control over the, the lights. Mm if it's smooth enough or if, if it's strong. And I can just very quickly adjust it all here. Um, one thing, another thing worth mentioning is that all the effects like bump mapping and let's say specular reflections, highlight reflections, are not visible until you add any kind of uh, point light source. So it could be, a, it could be just, uh, just a point lamp could be a sun lamp, area lamp, I don't know about Hemi, but it has to be some kind of a spotlight, uh, point light. So we have all those <coughs> fe uh, features, material features like bump or, or specular reflections visible. The HDR map I've added, it kind of generates this here, but I, I'm, I'm never happy when it comes to bump mapping. So I always add those two lamps just in case I need to have more depth in my materials. But it's all explained in the PDF and just jumping very quick to Photoshop. Since I'm um, creating quite a lot of these models, I really had to create a, a, sh a, a quick way of, oh, sorry. I had to create a quick way of processing the pictures and I never, try to cheat when it comes to the final picture. So what I always just stick to is increasing the contrast, the basic contrast using the curves. And I could do it in Blender as well. I just don't like the way Blender curves work. So please forgive me that. And it's just, just way, way quicker here because I can also save the, <coughs> the entire process. Um, sorry, here. As an action, as an action, yeah, uh, yeah, as an action, and then just launch it to every single picture. So they are all, all of them, are more or less uh, color corrected, right? 
The second thing I just very quickly add to my pictures is the color balance and I'm not trying to cheat on the colors to be honest when the colors aren't matching my expectations I just go back to blender and do it but for the presentation's sake I will just very quickly do some adjustments here and you can see those adjustments are probably barely visible um, uh, shift and scroll <laughs> The question was, what's the shortcut for this? And you just hold the shift key and scroll up and down. The touch I really feel is adding always something to the rendering is increasing the blue color in the highlights. I don't know why it, why it works like this. Uh, it just makes the picture more kind of natural, I would say. Yeah, and this is basically it. If I had the spot lamps added to this picture, I wouldn't have to use levels so harshly in here. So you can see using the levels tool, this graph here shows the amount of, uh, amount of white and gray values up until, up, down until black values around the picture. So you can, you can see I have lots of whites and different uh, very bright grays in my pictures. So I will just very quickly cut them off and now I have a perfect white background. Yeah, and I just yeah showed a little bit more of gray here. I just flatten everything and in the end just use the very basic sharp and on, on sharp mask, just some small values. So it adds a little more crisp to the picture it's a little bit noisy, but yeah. And that's it. So unfortunately, no time for questions, but I, I'll be around for a couple more hours. So if you have, if you would like to ask anything, just go ahead.